you are watching Trinity Channel. All right, welcome everyone. Welcome to our week on exposing the errors of the positive confession movement. And I'm your host, Matt Slick. That's S-L-I-C-K, an ordained minister. I run, I'm the founder and director of the Christian Apologetics and Research Ministry, CARM.org. I've been doing radio for 17 years, written a bunch of books, and I'm generally very irritating to a lot of unbelievers. Not on purpose, but just kind of happens that way. Now, we're going to have some guests here in a minute. We're going to get to them, Tony Costa and Dr. Clay Jones and Pastor Brian. And homes. But before we get to them, I want to let you know that we need, or ABN does need, your support. If you'd be so kind as to consider praying for them. Now, donations are always very important. We need donations. Everybody needs donations because you got to pay for the, the staff. you got to pay for the airtime and things like that. But you've also got to be praying for ABN. They do a great work. The enemy is seeking to destroy their effort. And the gospel is going out to all the corners of the world through this great ministry. So please consider supporting them and partnering with them in order to spread the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, this is, as I said, ABN's first prosperity gospel marathon, and that uh, ABN stands against false gospels. Now, I talked to the president uh, a few weeks ago about uh, some other issues. I was really pleased to find out that he is very, very, very dedicated to the truth of the Word of God, the sufficiency of Scripture, the truth of who Jesus Christ is, and that gospel message. I am so encouraged by AB, and I have been out to their studios uh, several times. They're great folks there, and uh, I, my heart is with them. You know, they're they're great folks. Now, in the past year, by God's grace, ABN has been able to successfully cover the 1040 window, including Africa, India, and China. They are expanding and looking to expand in more areas. Praise God for them. Remember, please consider supporting them prayerfully and financially because they certainly need that. And ABN is working on a discipleship project in eight Indian languages. Now, I wish I could do that. What a great opportunity. But this is what God's calling them to do. And last but not least, they're working on technical issues and have technical milestones. All ABN 10 channels from now on, hopefully, will be on without any problems whatsoever. So praise God. What I want to do is introduce our co host, our co-host, uh, co-host, our guests tonight. And we're going to be talking about the positive confession movement, its origins. So let's get to Tony Costa. And we also have Dr. Clay Jones and Pastor Brian Holmes. So we were all talking uh, before the show. We got to pray together, and these are all great guys. So what I'm going to do is just ask one after another to introduce themselves, what they do, how they can be contacted. Then we're going to get into the topic. So, Tony, the light's on you. Go for it. Yes, thanks, Matt. And uh, thank you for uh, for the kind introduction. And it's good to see uh, uh, my brother, Clay. And uh, is, it, is it Bruce? Or did I get your name right? It's Brian. What, my my name Brian. Brian Brian. <laughs> I just formally introduced you the, just today. Um, I'm I'm the only Canadian here on the panel, which I guess makes me special, uh, being one of God's frozen chosen from the north. And uh, I I teach at Toronto Baptist Seminary here in Toronto. I also do teaching with the University of Toronto. I'm also involved in pastoral ministry, and uh, I've been involved in the ministry of apologetics for. 30 plus years now. And so uh, the uh, Prosperity Gospel Word of Faith movement is one of the uh, areas that I've also uh, studied for the, the past three decades. Wow. Good stuff. You have a lot of good information. There's a lot to talk about with these guys. Uh, man, it's a deep topic. All right, Dr. Clay Jones, welcome. We've talked before. You. And uh, introduce yourself. Uh, well, I, uh, Clay Jones, you heard that part. Uh, I'm a visiting <laughs> scholar at Talbot School of Theology, and I've written books entitled um, Immortal, How the Fear of Death Drives Us, and What We Can Do About It, and then Why Does God Allow Evil? And uh, Dr. Costa was kind enough, in fact, to interview me on one of his programs. And uh, But anyway, uh, my special is evil and death and suffering. That's what I specialize in. And and that and, and why God allows evil in every aspect, and that would include everything from crusades, inquisitions, witch hunts, the Canaanites. I'm writing a book right now on the Canaanites. Uh, and so anyway, everything, everything and anything related to why, why people suffer 
And uh, and also when it comes to this, then the hiddenness of God, because I believe that uh, God is not interested in doing lots of miracles all the time. Yes, that is correct. Um, I've been praying for some for my wife, and uh, I'm still praying for some. And for I think wife. you should. And I will, and will continue to. Uh, you know, <laughs> once she's married to me, so she needs a lot of prayer. That's one issue, but, uh, you know, we'll deal with that. All right, now, last but not least is the most tan Pastor Brian Holmes. <laughs> so why don't you introduce yourself to everybody? Hi, I'm Pastor Brian, and I, I guess maybe... Uh, the tan is giving it away, but I'm the, I'm the one in Florida. So, um, yeah, I'm a pastor here. I'm also the uh, president, founder, and kind of chief um, disciple maker at my own ministry. It's called Empowered Christian Ministries. And uh, also the author of the book, The Empowered Christian Roadmap, where I gave a significant section towards uh, the idea of health and wealth and the prosperity gospel and the word of faith movement. Um, because it's such a snare um, to biblical Christianity. And I, I think it's extremely important that we touch on this, um, that we understand what part of it can be true, what part of it is definitely not biblical, um, and kind of how to understand illness and sickness and suffering in light of um, our call to be a disciple that makes disciples. And so um, I'm also a big part of ABN's 1040 Discipleship Project. I've been writing the lessons for over a year now, um, and those are being translated and communicated um, across the nations through the 1040 window. And so I've been uh, been partnering with ABN for for over a year. Um, and so it's it's a privilege and a blessing to to be a part of this. And I'm um, I'm happy to continue to educate and and help disciple and raise up. Uh, Christians who know their doctrine and who are walking out the call. Amen, brother. I love to hear that. One of my passions is to equip Christians on good biblical theology, Christology, soteriology, and things like that. And uh, most Christians just, you know, they don't know a lot. And uh, I've been doing apologetics for decades and really enjoy that part of it. All right. Now, so we've got some topics we're going to get into here on the positive confession movement. As I always say to people, the first thing we need to do is define our terms. So uh, why don't we just start with Dr. Tony Costa. What would you say is a uh, positive confession and maybe when did it start? Uh, the, the positive confession movement is believed to have started uh, around the 50s, 60s in the United States. And it was really popularized by Norman Vincent Peale. And uh, he's sometimes called the father of positive confession. And the, the 50s in the United States was a significant decade because this was the beginning of what would be called the New Age movement that began to really meet its heyday in the 60s with the advent of Eastern mysticism and gurus and, and various <clears throat> Eastern cults that came to the American shores. And the idea arose that um, the New Age teaches that we are inherently divine, that we really are God, that, that we have God consciousness and that we are all connected. It's a very pantheistic view of reality that we're all God. And so the idea is that if you are divine within yourself, then you could actually visualize uh, positivity. You could, uh, you could confess positively that you'll be well. You'll confess positively you'll be wealthy. You can confess positively that you'll have the best wife, the best home, the best family, and so forth. And the positive confession movement uh, later influenced a number of Christian leaders. Uh, the late Robert Schuller was heavily influenced by Norman Vincent Peale. And, and the, the, the dangers of this movement is that it begins to uh, undermine what the Bible, uh, uh, when the Bible speaks about judgment and eternal damnation, hell, and separation from God. Well, these are very negative things. And so what would happen is people are like Robert Schuller, for example, would say that he would never tell anyone that they're going to hell. Because everything about positive confession is just, just focus on the positive. And yet in the Bible, in the New Testament, Jesus was one of the most contrary people to the positive confession movement. You know, John the Baptist and Jesus Christ spoke more about damnation and hell than, than, than heaven itself. And the message of the prophets in the Old Testament was also one of repentance and judgment and so forth. So the, the positive confession movement really has its roots in, in what would later become the New Age movement. And it's all predicated on the idea that we are all divine within ourselves. 
Yeah, you yeah. know, I used to live in Southern California, and uh, I went to Robert Schuller's church. I remember very, very early on in my Christian walk, I wanted to see how long it would take for him to say the word Jesus in his sermon. And so I went there, and the first 20 minutes, Jesus wasn't mentioned. It took 20 minutes before he mentioned Jesus. And then I went to Calvary Chapel, listened to Chuck Smith preach, and the very first word out of his mouth was the word Jesus. And that's where I went. You know, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Uh, uh, he also said, uh, Schuler also said that Jesus died to sanctify our ego trip. Yeah, he's basically a, a false teacher. So, uh, so the idea of the power of the spoken word, I, I think, Tony, what you said about the issue of, uh, you know, the, uh, the New Age movement tied in with it, it's very true. It's very, very insightful. So do any, let's try this, uh, Dr. Clay, would you say there are any, any uh, positive confession teachers that say we're divine by any chance? Have you heard of that? You know, I can't say it rings a bell, but I have to say, although, as we'll talk about a little later, I've had some experience in positive confession myself when I was a teenager. I, I can't say that that's ringing a bell, but it may be the, somebody else can, I'm sure, do a better yeah, job they, than me. The, yeah, there are. <laughs> yeah, there are definitely people who said that they were divine or little gods and things like that. Joyce Meyer says it. You know, you said, to, uh, Dr. Tony, you said that you were uh, involved in this when you were younger. Could you tell us about this? Because I think it'd be really interesting and relevant to what we're talking about. As a young Christian, I was I was trying to find a home church. And so I got involved for a bit in, in a charismatic church. Yeah. And I began to hear uh, things such as uh, when I would, when the pastor would ask me, how are you doing, Tony? And I would say, I'm okay. They would say, no, 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 don't say okay. Say I'm blessed. Don't use any negative thinking or negative speech because your words have power. And, and therefore, everything was about never, never, uh, never using anything that was perceived to be negative language. And I merely realized there's something wrong with this. This type of thinking is wrong. And everything was a name it and claim it, or as I, or it has been, I think Dr. Walter Martin called it blab it and grab it. And, and so everything became just this positive confession, positive visualization. And it made you feel like you had to live to a certain standard of righteousness that as we all know, we cannot meet that bar. Right. Only Christ has met that for us. And so it just created a lot of angst and, and despair in me until, uh, thank God, I, I was rooted in a, a biblically-based church. Amen. And I know that, uh, Dr. Uh, Jones, you too were involved a lot in, in the youth when you were younger with this movement. Could you tell us about that, what your experience was? Well, I was raised in a church called Melody Land Christian Center, which <laughs> It was a big church. It sat 3,700 people at one time, uh, and uh, they had three Sunday morning services. They were not into confession teaching themselves. I want to be clear about that. But I started to run into that doctrine, and uh, I, I, for a while there, I embraced it. I thought, well, but now I'm now this is when I'm 19, right? I wasn't a youth minister yet. I'm 19. I thought this makes sense, and I remember somebody, you know, the the key one of the key verses was. Uh, by his stripes, you are healed. And so healing's in the atonement. And so don't you believe that? And so then it came down to, uh, I started to agree with the idea. If I, I've got to have faith and everybody else does too. And so I've got to, uh, if I pray for God to heal me or somebody else, then they need to be careful not to say they're not healed. They need to say they are healed and that what they're just experiencing are symptoms. In other words, so you pray for somebody that had the flu and they go, I'm healed. And, you know, four or five days later, the fever would go away and they go, see, those were just symptoms. I was healed a week earlier. But one day, uh, like I said, probably 19, a guy came, a friend came up to me and he said, where did Jesus ever heal like that? And that one comment, I went, he's right. And I was done with it. Uh, I mean, just with that one comment, I went, he's right. It's over. Uh, Jesus never healed that way. Uh, this just isn't true. But so, yeah, I did have I did have my a, a, a brief time where I was actually, you know, teaching a high school Bible study and and I was teaching them that too bad. But I've made other mistakes, too, in life. <laughs> other mistakes, man. We could have a whole show on on the, our, our mistakes, starting with the letter A only. Um, <clears throat> all right, Pastor Brian. Hey, let's hear what you got. You've got any experience with this stuff or pe people in your church have come out of it or. 
What yeah, I, I encounter it. I mean, by the grace of God, I did not grow up in a church in it. You know, I, I was actually far from church for a lot of years. I, I'm a latecomer to to the faith, um, born and raised Catholic and kind of, you know, a believer of of Jesus for many years, but but wayward for many years. But by the grace of God, I was prevented from getting involved in a church like this. And so when I started my journey in faith, um, I just went out and, and tried to absorb as much as I could. And I saw some of that and I saw a lot of other teachers and the Lord just blessed me with discernment and the ability to reason through. Um, luckily, I knew um, early on that I needed to trust the Bible as my source, as my authority. And so the more I did that, the more I would test and measure the claims that everyone was making and find, OK, this just isn't biblical. Um you know, and I and I hated that there was, you know, on one side there was this complete derail from what Scripture says about healing, and about um, the this name it and claim it kind of positive confession stuff. Um, you know, and the, on, then on the other hand, there was there was just idea that there there are no miracles, and and almost God just lives in the Bible, and He doesn't do anything in the world as well. Um, you know, and I came to find find that the the truth is really somewhere in the middle um and we just need to be more discerning more cautious but i was a part of one small church uh, years ago that had a little bit of this they were primarily biblical but there was just there wasn't so much that i hit you know hit the ground running but there was enough there that when they asked me to be on their leadership team and they gave me um you know they wanted me to sign something i said and and none of these ideas were even in the statement that I had to sign, but I knew that they believed in it. And I said, let, we need to have a conversation about this. And they did not like that and actually asked me to step away and said, I said, okay, that's fine. Um, I, you know, it, it would prefer to stay here and influence this environment for good, but if that's not an option, then I'll go elsewhere. So. Hey, praise God. You know, uh, Dr. Jones, you said that I uh, went to Melody Land. I also used to go to Melody Land, but uh, I would go for uh, the teaching of Dr. Walter Martin. And we called it Martin's Church. Yes. That's right. That's what they years. called it. Everybody called it Martin's Church that was in yeah. the Fellowship Center, right? That's <laughs> right. And the other guys here should be envious of us because we had that, right. that ability to do that. And uh, you know, he was a great guy. So I never got tripped up in the idiocy of positive confession because it was very early on and learned all that. But I, I forget who was talking about this, when, which one of us was talking about it. But the idea of the spoken word, one of the things I think is important is we understand that what they're advocating is a form of sorcery. You say certain things now and you get a guaranteed spiritual result. Uh, anybody want to comment on that? Yeah, that, that idea is uh, it's based on Genesis 1, 3, where God says, let there be light, and there was light. And so the, the word faith teachers like Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagen, and Joyce Myers, and Frederick Price, and all the, all the, other, uh, all the other promoters, they, they all taught that we're little gods, that God is actually introducing himself, much like the Mormons teach. Uh, yeah. The only difference is you become a god in the afterlife, in the exaltation, whereas word faith teachers say, no, you're little gods right now. You know, do, uh, Benny Hinn said dogs beget uh, dogs and cats beget cats and God begets gods. That's an exact quote. And so if we're little gods, uh, then we can we could visualize reality through our spoken word. And so if you say something, it's supposed to happen just the way God said things and things happened. So it is a form of sorcery because it is it is erasing the the, the lines of demarcation between the creator and the creature. Where, where the creature is trying to serve God's authority and buy into the lie of the serpent and be like God himself. Uh, and we're not God. We're not little gods. My wife can tell you I'm not a God. Uh, and and, and it's, it's very important for us to realize that these word faith creatures uh, are blasphemers. They're, they're telling us that we are carbon copies of God, that we're little gods running around the earth. I agree with you. Okay, well, here's a question then. Uh, would you say they're saved? Like someone like Kenneth Copeland. Um, I don't believe he's a Christian. I don't believe he's regenerate. That's my opinion. I don't either. No. And uh, Benny Hinn is a, in my opinion, is a complete charlatan. Yeah. Okay. And I don't believe Joyce Meyer is a Christian either because of the th some of the things she's taught and she hasn't repented of. No. 
So Copeland denies the deity of Christ. In fact, he, he who had, does Copeland? He actually had a word of, of a word prophecy yes. in Victory Magazine where where Jesus is speaking through him allegedly, and Jesus says they they killed me for claiming to be God, even though I never claimed to be God. Right. That is a direct contradiction of John 8, 58, where Jesus clearly says, I am. Yeah. It's right. As you said that God appeared to him, or Jesus appeared to him and was told him this. Well, then, well, obviously, uh, it wasn't the Jesus of the Bible. And, uh, you know, what bothers me is, why is it? Uh, this is for the pastor, the pastor in the room. Okay, now, uh, why is it, Mr. Pastor Dude, <laughs> the congregations don't seem to be informed about this? Because my radio show, I say, pastors are the ones who are supposed to call to equip and to train. I don't think pastors are doing a good enough job. I'm sure you're doing a great job, okay, because you're on the show. You wouldn't be there, you know, if you wouldn't. So what do you think about this? Why are Christians so ignorant about all this stuff? Well, there. Well, for one, there's a lot of people who identify as Christian who are not in churches. And if many of them are in churches, they're not in biblical churches. Um, you know, so – they may be turning on the TV networks and getting the the prosperity preaching a lot more regularly than they are burying their head, you know, in the Bible or in a biblical church. Um, as to why some of the pastors aren't calling it out, uh, that's a good question. That's exactly why I did. <laughs> um, you know, it, it it's actually so so pervasive within the Christian. Um, world that I actually like when I put it in the book, I have a whole section. I'm like guiding you through this roadmap metaphor. And I have a whole section about ideas that are completely false, completely demonic. And I expose a whole bunch of false religions and counterfeit Christian cults and all these different kind of things. And then I actually, the next chapter, I talk about the things that we believe, the thoughts, the emotions that we deal with, and how to align them so that way we can live truly empowered. And I actually included my word of faith section in there, uh, I believe quite graciously, because I, and I tell people this regularly, I could have included this in the false religion section, but I think that there's, there's nuance to the conversation and a lot of people believe certain lies without going all the way into the deep end all the way, right? Not and, and I give a list of, you know, Kenneth Copeland and Joel Osteen and Benny Hinn and a bunch of others. And I say, just FYI, here's prominent people who teach some of these ideas. Some are worse than others. Um, and I mentioned some that that aren't as bad, but but have some of this stuff. And then and then I, I give a quote or two of Kenneth Copeland, and then I quickly go into the actual ideas and where they come from. Because ultimately, it's it, you know, it, it's not about just calling people's names and making them the villain. It's about what's the truth, where's our authority, where's it in the Bible, and let's educate people on that. And I think if pastors focus on doing that, um, and occasionally they might need to call out certain names but i think if we focus more on the actual beliefs themselves um that will that'll better serve the body of christ and then we'll you know you get good at knowing what a real dollar looks like and then you can recognize the counterfeit amen to that but let me ask you do you think you should pastors should name names from the pulpit um i think there's a time and a place for it i, I don't know that would you I say something like constantly well, not constantly, but would you say if in the pulpit, Joyce Meyer's a heretic? Put you on the spot. I would, I, I would say definitely certain things she says okay. are, I would say, borderline heretical. Um, I, I want to, I think ultimately, um, I try not to judge whether or not a person is born again, because I understand how easy it is to be deceived. Right. Um, yeah. I know people, you know, including that church that, that I was a part of who loved the Lord, who had a lot of true beliefs, who I believe are born again and still deceived. And so, um, you know, I, I think it's possible to have false beliefs, false ideas, wrong thinking, mm -hmm. 
and still be saved and ultimately only God can see the spirit and see if they're born again or not. Right. But um, either way, I think we need to preach the truth. We need to say this thing is 100% unbiblical. And, and the people who are notorious for doing unbiblical things over and over and over again for years and years, uh, I would avoid them like the plague because, you know, a, a, a bad tree bears bad fruit. Amen to that. So uh, I got a quote um, from Joyce Meyer. And uh, so let's check this out. I got two quotes from her. We can check it out. We'll see what you guys think of this. We can get to maybe Tony after this. Uh, he could have helped himself up to the point, as Jesus could have helped himself up until the point where he said, I commend my spirit into your hands. At that point, he couldn't do nothing for himself anymore. He had become sin. He was no longer the son of God. So uh, Tony, what do you think of that? Yeah, that's outright blasphemy. Uh, that's spiritually saying that God the Son ceased to be God, mm -hmm. which is a contradiction in term. God cannot cease to be God. And you also need to understand that Joyce Myers and Kenneth Copeland, both of them believe that Jesus went to hell. And I, I don't mean Hades, I mean hell. And, and she taught that he suffered in hell and that he was beaten in hell. And Copeland teaches the same thing. It's very likely she got it from Copeland. And basically that the atonement was not made on the cross. The atonement was completed in hell. And, and so th the problem with that is that it violates scripture. Jesus said it is finished. He didn't say to be continued. And we also need to understand that Christ's sacrifice was a perfect sacrifice that satisfied the justice of God and made uh, satisfaction uh, and procured our salvation. So, so what she's basically saying there is that the second person of the Trinity ceased to be the Son of God. Uh, Copeland literally said he became a satanic being on the cross. I don't think he can become more blasphemous than that, to claim that the holy, uh, immaculate Lamb of God, the, the, the pure Son of God, would become a satanic being on the cross uh, is outright blasphemy. So this is not the gospel of grace. Um, Galatians 1, 6 to 9 is very clear that if anyone preaches a gospel other than the gospel that was preached by the apostles, that gospel of grace, Paul says, let him be anathema. And the word anathema is, is, is virtually a Greek word that means to be under the, the, to be under the damnation of God, the judgment of God. Um, so by their own words, they shall be judged, Jesus said. And, and this is public record, what you just provided there, Matt. She went public with that. And, and so... You know, Paul tells us in, in Romans 16 to mark those who cause divisions among you. Mark them and call them out. And so these 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 folks have done a great, a great harm to the body of Christ. Yeah, I agree. Now, we've got to take a break here because it's the bottom of the hour. But I'd like to get back when we get back and talk about the issue of um, uh, of this idea of what the positive confessionists teach about Jesus paying the price in hell because you mentioned it tony you mentioned it uh but it needs to be explored and the listeners need to understand why that is so serious and why it's a damnable heresy and what that is because we need as godly christian men who know the truth we need to be able at the appropriate time say false teacher good teacher and we need to be able to say that is that's damnable or not damnable heresy. This is a damnable heresy to say that uh, what they say about Jesus finishing the atonement in hell. So I believe we've got a break now and uh, hopefully let things work out with that. So what we'll do is take a break. We'll be right back after these messages. We'll get to the issue of Jesus paying for our sins in hell. We'll have some more conversations with uh, Pastor Brian Holmes, with uh, Dr. Tony Costa, Dr. Clay Jones and a guy named Slick. We'll be right back after these messages. You are watching Trinity Channel. Dear Trinity Channel and ABN viewers, we are excited to announce Trinity Channel's first marathon of 2022. The Prosperity Gospel Marathon will be premiering Monday, April 4th through Friday, April 8th, every day from 8 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We are looking forward to having you join us for the whole marathon Monday through Friday. 
so that we can learn together the Word of God and be aware of false gospels, thus sharing the true gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ around the globe. For more information, visit www.trinitychannel.com, www.abnsat.com, www.abnglobal.tv, www.1040discipleship.com, or you can call us at 1-248-416-1300. May God bless you richly. You are watching Trinity Channel. Whoops, sorry, there we go. Sorry about that. Welcome back, everyone. This is ABN's first Prosperity Gospel Marathon, and I'm your host, Matt Slick. We're talking with uh, three magnificent gentlemen here. We have uh, Tony Costa. We have uh, Pastor Brian. We have um, Pastor, I mean, uh, Dr. Jones. And before the uh, the break, we talked, or I wanted to talk about the issue of um, of what they teach, what the positive confessionist people uh, teach regarding the atonement of Christ. Now, the atonement of Christ is very important because John 19.30, Jesus says it is finished. In 1 Peter 2.24, he bore our sin in his body on the cross. This is where he made atonement and the shedding of his blood, and by his blood we are cleansed, you know, 1 John 1.7. So we can go through the doctrine and lay it out that the atonement uh, was, was finished on the cross of Christ. So, for example, uh, uh, Joyce Meyer said that uh, he paid for our sins in hell. He became our sacrifice and he died on the cross. He did not stay dead. He was in the grave three days. During that time, he entered hell where you and I deserve to go legally because of our sins. He paid the price there. All right, so let's get back to our, our guys here, um, the three gentlemen, and let's talk about this this issue. Uh, Tony uh, and uh Brian and Dr. Jones, could you, Dr. Jones, could you uh, expound on this a little bit? Why is this such a dangerous teaching? Well, other than that, it's just simply not biblical. And it, it you know, and the whole thing about, uh, well, anyway, I might not, I might be going in a direction you weren't actually asking, but the whole thing sure. about uh, God wants you to be well all the time or wealthy. And we talked about that somewhat yesterday that, that he wants is one, it, it, it fails the reality test. Uh, it's, it's not honest and, uh, you're turning God into some sort of a machine that if you put in the right, I call it open sesame prayer or open, you know, I, if I say it just right in just the way that he wants it said, then he's going to act. And I find that to be troubling to say the least. And, uh, so anyway, I'll, I'll let others answer beyond that. Yeah, there's a lot there we could talk about. There's a lot to talk about. But I wanted to get to the essentials of that faith. Uh, uh, Tony, what would you say about the, when they say that the atonement was finished in hell? Why is that such a serious thing? Well, because the the atonement uh, was based on the Old Testament concept of, of the sin offering, sin offering, guilt offering, and so forth. And the atonement is made with the shedding of blood. You know, Leviticus 17.11 uh, it is the blood that makes atonement for your souls. Uh, and I've given you the blood on the altar to make atonement. And so it is the shedding of blood. It is the giving up of life. It is, it is the death of an innocent victim. Uh, in the Old Testament, of course, goats and sheep and oxen, but, it, but they're all pointing to the Lamb of God who was to come. Uh, and so what they do, Matt, is they take 2 Corinthians 5.21, where Paul says, he who knew no sin became sin. Uh, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And what they do is they literally take that to mean that Jesus Christ became a sinner. Uh, instead of looking at it in terms of the, the, the substitution that Christ takes the place of the sinner, when it says that he whom you know sin became sin, it, it, it is using the language of, of the sin offering of Leviticus 6.25. And in fact, the NIV provides a footnote that's, that even says, or a sin offering. So the idea of Christ becoming sin doesn't mean that he ceased to be the holy son of God and became a sinner on the cross. 
what it means is he representationally took the place of sinners on the cross so that he could impute his righteousness to us and that he could take our sins upon himself as the as the the substitute and it's interesting that in leviticus 6 25 the sin offering is holy before it is killed it is holy even after it is killed it remains holy it doesn't become defiled by sin at all and so christ did not become defiled on the cross christ took upon himself as our holy substitute our sins so that the great exchange could take place at calvary he takes your sins and my sins and then he imputes his righteousness to us. Um, and, and so you need to understand that a lot of these faith teachers, they're not theologians. And I don't, I'm not saying you have to be a theologian to know the Bible, but these folks do not have probably, they probably don't even have more than a year or two in Greek or Hebrew. And so they don't understand the meaning of this terminology and they simply fly off with it. Uh, and this is why you really get this bad theology, such as Jesus went to hell and that he suffered there. And even though the Apostles' Creed says he died and he descended into hell, it's not talking about Jesus going and suffering in hell. This this has to do with the what's been called the harrowing of hell, where Jesus went to Hades and he went to declare his victory to those in 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 uh, what would be called uh, Abraham's bosom and in, in the righteous among those among Hades, and that he declared his his victory to them, and then he emptied it out. And this becomes a, a powerful imagery particularly in the Eastern Church with, with the idea of Christ breaking through the, the gates of Hades and liberating the Old Testament saints. Amen to that. Uh, yeah, it's a, it is a damnable heresy to say that the atoning work of Christ was not sufficient in and of itself on that cross and that something else had to happen and that he went to hell and suffered there. That's not what the Bible teaches, obviously. I love that you said imputation. A lot of people don't know what that is, but it's a legal term. Uh, we sin because by breaking the law of God, First John three four, and so sin not it, sin is a legal problem, but not only a legal problem. To impute means uh, to reckon to another's account re legally. So um, we can get into the theology of that some other time. All right, uh, Doctor Jones. Um, so uh, let me ask you. Was everybody healed in, in the, for example, the New Testament? Uh, I'm teaching through Philippians at my home Bible study, and we went right through Philippians 2. Some of us not healed. So uh, Paul couldn't heal them. So uh, was everybody healed? Is that supposed to be how it is? No. Uh, you know, that's, uh, I, yeah, thank you for asking that. You know, that's one of the most interesting things to me is the Apostle Paul didn't heal everybody. And if anybody after Jesus was going to be like this great, uh, have the great ability to heal people, you'd think it would be Paul. But as you were just mentioning in Philippians uh, chapter two, uh, he says, well, you know, my brother Epaphroditus was sad that he heard you. He was sick. He says he was very ill and distressed that you heard it. Indeed, he was near death. Now listen to these next words. But God had mercy on him and not only on him, but me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Notice Paul doesn't say, well, of course he was healed. I never had the slightest doubt. He doesn't say that. What he says is um, the Lord had mercy on him. In other words, it wasn't an exp it wasn't something that Paul, oh yeah, for sure, God's going to heal him. That was not what Paul said. Uh, Paul said in another place, he said, I left Trophimus sick at Miletus. Well, wait a minute. I don't understand. The great apostle Paul was with a brother, and the brother, in this case named Trophimus, was sick. And Paul didn't just go, "Hey, no problem here. Uh, I'm going to lay my hands on you, and you're going to be you're going to be well." Uh, I, and, and so again and again and again, not well. One more, I'll give you one more right off the top of my head. Uh, Paul says to Timothy, uh, "Take a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent Ill illnesses." Well, for crying out loud, Paul, why don't you just lay your hands on Timothy? ask him to be healed, and for crying out loud, he was not going to need to have wine anymore, and he's not going to have stomach problems anymore. So there's just three examples in the scripture. Oh, well, let's just give one more. Uh, of course, and I know what they say. Confession teachers say that, that Paul's thorn in the flesh wasn't physical. I think it probably was physical. We don't know 100% for sure, but he asked the Lord. It was obviously causing him great trouble, and the Lord says, no, my strength is sufficient for you. And so the scripture itself does not teach that God always, you know, I mean, if Paul couldn't heal people, 
uh, the average Christian in the pew somewhere is surely going to have have some struggles if uh, Paul uh, Paul wasn't able to do it. Amen. Good stuff. Now, I want to quote a scripture, tell you a little bit of an anecdote here, and then I want to get to uh, Brian and ask him some questions here. So years ago, when I used to live in San Diego, I had a friend, and uh, he was into the positive confession movement a great deal. Oh, you had to believe that you're healed. You can't confess anything negative. He was into this. And I said, let me ask you, is it ever the case that God would make someone, say, blind? And he said, of course not. So then I went to Exodus 4.11. And it's, you know, I had him read it, okay, where God is talking to Moses and God wants Moses to talk to Pharaoh and some of the things. And Moses says, I'm not a good talker and all this stuff. The Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth or who makes him mute or deaf or sing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? So my friend read this. I can still see him looking at the Bible, reading the verse. He had never seen it before. And I waited a full minute of silence. He finally looked at me and he said, I don't know what it means, but it doesn't mean what it says. I never forgot that. And I was dumbfounded by that. But uh, that's typical of the people in the positive confession movement. It doesn't mean what it says. It can only mean what we want it to say according to how we interpret it and submit it uh, to what it is that we teach. Like uh, by our stripes were healed and therefore... We're supposed to be healed of everything, right? God would never right. do that. So, uh, <clears throat> Pastor Brian, uh, let's talk about that. By his stripes, we're healed. And uh, why would God, why would he allow illness in the, in the world? Doesn't he want the best for us? Is it our best life now? I mean, come on. Um, yeah, two, two big questions. Um, so, the first one is, you know, and maybe we come back to the other one because I feel like that could even require some unpacking. Um, but I hear all the time, by his stripes were healed, and I, I would consider myself cautiously charismatic. Um, I don't. We were talking about that a little before we started, <laughs> so I might be the outlier here. But um, but I think cautiously is I think that's an important word because it, it helps pr keep the guardrails up to know that God is possible. You know, God can do all things, um, and I think if the Bible. Uh, shows us that God does heal and he'll use us to heal, then we should embrace that as much as possible and believe for it. Um, but so when, but a lot of times that gets quoted as this blanket statement where, um, you know, by his stripes were healed, by his stripes were healed. Um, so it's first meant to mean people interpret this as physical healing rather than some other form of healing. And then also that it always happens, that it, that God wants it to happen 100% of the time when this is clearly not true because of all of the examples just given. Um, and I would, I, I'll throw my hat in the ring when it comes to Paul's thorn. Um, I believe it was also talking about a physical healing. And I even make the case for that in my blog on the website at empowerchristian.org that it's his eyesight that it never fully healed after being blinded on the road to Damascus and evidence of this are the fact that he ends up with the traveling companion, Dr. Luke, to help him get around. Um, he's got other people writing his letters. And in one of his letters, he says, you'll notice I'm writing it myself because of the super big letters, right? So he can't see very well. And it, he's also telling people, um, you know, I come to you and I'm not all impressive in person, but I'm weighty in my letters. And they're probably seeing this guy who doesn't look that impressive with his bad eyesight. But anyway, you know, that same um, I might be, I'm kind of getting derailed. So the, but Paul also says at that same, in that same, um, that same letter, basically he prays and asks God three times to take it away. And God essentially says, no, <laughs> my grace is sufficient for you. So when it comes to, does God allow illness sometimes? Yes. We know it for a fact because it says it right there. And that whole entire account just flies in the face of the prosperity gospel, this idea that God always wants you to be healthy. It's never within his will that your illness does not go away. Sometimes it is. And Paul tells us even what one of the benefits is because of this, it keeps him humble. It keeps him relying on the power of God and on the grace of God rather than in his own strength. And it keeps him from becoming conceited even though he's being used to do all kinds of miracles and have these great revelations. So um, that's a number of things 
uh, you know, that, that point to the fact that God does use illness and there's a reason for it. And ultimately, um, it will glorify him and benefit those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that. And then maybe we can come back to that other stuff. I don't want to hog up the, the air here. No, please hog it up. That's, that's fine. You, you know, if I could add something in here, uh, I, you, you said you're cautiously charismatic. I'm not a cessationist and, and I totally support Matt praying for his wife. Uh, I pray for healing. I, I'm not, God can heal and he can do miracles anytime he wants. His hands are not tied. Uh, but uh, I, I just, sometimes though, I think that a lot of these hyper charismatic churches, and I don't, you know, as far as I know, Bethel, for instance, is not a hyper, I mean, start over. As far as I know, Bethel uh, does not teach the confession teaching, as far as I know. Uh, but I'll tell you, they've done a lot of damage. Uh, for instance, I'll just give you one example of the case of Nabil. A lot of people know who Nabil Quershi is. I mean, they told him, point blank, you are going to be healed and you're going to be God's general uh, when you're done. This was, they got around and prophesied and he, and honestly, Nabil went, he was then put in a huge bind and the bind that he was put in was, I can't confess, I can't say that God, anything less than God intends to heal me. And I actually sent, we had some email exchanges about this. I said, you need to say, I believe God, it's fine to say if you say, I believe God's going to heal me, but here's the key. If he doesn't, if he doesn't, I'm still uh, I'm still a servant of Christ and I still trust him uh, because to, otherwise it just it, it doesn't sound very good. And so I'm very concerned about that. And as a result, it cuts down. I, I've known a youth minister in our church uh, years ago, a youth minister's wife died of cancer. They would not let her confess that she wasn't going to be healed. They would not. They refused. You can't do it. And you can imagine these young moms. She was a young mom gathering around her and going, you're going to be well. No, you are. You can't say anything less. What it does is you can't. She couldn't really grieve. And by the way, she did die. Uh, but she honored God to the end, but she couldn't. Uh, anyway, I, I think this is really very, very hurtful. This kind of thing of you cannot confess that you won't be healed. That's nonsense. The Lord is my father and I can come to him and ask for what I want. And he's going to either give it to me or not. It's to me, it's, it's, the, it's just not any more complex than that. Yeah. You know, um, my wife and I buried a son. He uh, was diagnosed with something called holoprosencephaly while in uh, in the womb. And we prayed for healing. And uh, he died in our arms. He did. And uh, we had a funeral. My wife has something called um, Louise Dietz. And because of it, she's had open heart surgery, gallbladder surgery. She's had numerous back surgeries, hand surgeries, feet surgeries. She's got osteoporosis. She also has stupid as husband does. She's got a lot of issues people pray for. I have Asperger's. A lot of people don't know that, but I've been diagnosed. I've been, I've prayed for, I have tinnitus, 80 decibel tinnitus. We have our, our issues in our, in the world that we have to go through. Now, this is real. Now, my wife and I, every night we pray for her. I pray for her healing, for a good uh, sleep for her because she's in pain. She has a lot of pain all the time. And so, you know, we talk theoretically, we can get into the scriptures and this doctrine, that doctrine, but, you know, John 14, 14, it's, it is a verse I actually do think about. Jesus says, ask me anything in my name and I will do it. Well, what if you do say, Lord, please heal my son. And he doesn't. Please heal my wife. And he doesn't. What do we do about that? Isn't that what Jesus said? Didn't he say? That uh, he would, you know, he'll give us whatever we want. Isn't that what it is? Tony, what do you think of that? Yeah, John 14, 14, Lord Jesus says, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. And he also said, whatever you ask the Father in my name, the Father will do it so that he may be glorified in the Son as well. But we need to be careful because we, we have the tendency to isolate scripture and tunnel vision. And we need to understand that the one who wrote the fourth gospel, John, who wrote the fourth gospel, also wrote three epistles, including the book of Revelation. And his first epistle, 1 John 5, 14, he does say that if we ask anything of God, if we ask anything and make our petitions known, um, he will hear us um, 
in accordance with his will. Yeah. If we ask anything That's in right. accordance with his will, he hears us and he will give us the petition that we ask of him. And so we need to understand that it's not my will, but as the Lord Jesus taught us, thy will be done, not my will, not my will, but thine will, thy will be done. So we, we can't just isolate passages. And that's what's so dangerous about the word faith teachers. And again, a lot of Christians do this too. They isolate passages. That's what cults do. But when you compare scripture with scripture, spiritual with spiritual, we find out that what Jesus is saying is, yeah, you can ask anything in my name. It will be done. But we also need to understand there is this thing called the sovereign will of God, that God knows what's best for us. He allows things to happen for our good. The outward man is perishing. The inward man is being renewed day by day. And, and I take solace in the fact, uh, Matt, and, and I really empathize with you because, I mean, I've seen a lot of suffering in my life as well. My mom died when she was 56, 57 of throat cancer, and she never smoked. My dad did. Um, and so it was really hard losing a mom at, at, at uh, when I was a young adult. But I could say that, as Paul says in Romans 8, I, don't, I reckon that the, the present sufferings of this world is nothing to be compared to the glory that is to be revealed. And so when we go into eternity with Christ, all of what we've gone through, our ailments, our sufferings, it'll be like a drop in a bucket. That's right. Compared to eternity. And I know Dr. Jones has, is, has written on this as well. So, so um, you know, the, the reality of suffering is real. And does God heal? Absolutely. I've seen That's, him heal. I've sure. seen people heal the cancer and so forth. Does he always heal? No. And the only answer we have is scripture says that it, it is his will, his sovereign will at the end of the day is what's best for us. And might I chime in and add, I said this on the show yesterday, uh, only one thing, and, and you know this, Tony, I, I put in my book, only one thing is going to prevent every single person watching this program, uh, every single person, the only thing that's going to prevent you from watching every single person you know die from murder, accident, or disease is going to be your own death from murder, accident, or disease. I like to kid people go, so have a nice day. But that's true. I don't care what, you know, I mean, what, how are you going to name and claim out of that? You're going to watch everyone you know die from murder, accident, or disease. And the only thing that's going to prevent that is your own death from murder, accident, or disease. And suffering, as Tony and, and Matt has pointed out, I've, I've had bone cancer, for crying out loud. My wife suffers a lot. Wow. Uh, and But you know what? God has used that in my life to make me more like him. And, and that's the point. It's our life is not about this life. Our, this, you know, Matt mentioned it before we came on your best life. Now your best life later, folks, your best life is in heaven forever and ever and ever and ever. It's not now. Amen, Amen brother. Oh, I love to hear that. You know, we got a break coming up here quickly, but um, uh, you know, I want to get my wife on the radio. I've been on for 17 years and uh, she's not, into speaking in public but uh i talk about her uh a lot okay break in five we talk about her on the radio every now and then and here's a concept a lot of people don't realize that she has a lot of suffering she really does and uh poor woman but she never ever has doubted god her faith has never waned in god oh well, she's asked why and as a theologian, as an apologist, I've asked God, why? Not in a defiant way, but Lord, why? And if he doesn't tell me, that's okay. Because he's the king, not us. He knows what's best and he allows it. And so many times people say, no, I don't want God's will for us, for me, because it might be inconvenient. It might yeah. not be pleasant. And I, I'm sorry. Oh, go I was ahead, just going to say, if I might add... Uh, when I was diagnosed in 2004 with having bone cancer, it, it was like seven o'clock in the morning in January, middle of winter. It was cold. It was kind of dark. And I'm walking this hallway, you know, because they run these MRI machines, you know, almost 24 seven. They run in it. So I'm there for an appointment to run an MRI at 7 a.m. And I'm walking down this bleak hallway. And of course, I found out I've got bone cancer. And I said to the Lord, why? And I wasn't, as you said, Matt, I was not complaining. I wasn't going, how dare you? What is going on here? This isn't fair. But I was just really asking why. And, you know, this is rare, uh, but immediately the words came to mind, everyone's going to go through this. And what I meant, what that meant to me was every single person, again, watching this program 
you are going to walk, unless you die suddenly, like through an accident, you're going to walk down a hallway wondering whether or not you're going to get life ending news. Everyone's going to do this. Like I say, unless you die suddenly, everyone is going to walk down a hallway at a doctor's office in at least in North America and going, am I going to get the news now that is going to say your life is going to end? And so, uh, and, and that actually, this may not make others feel better, but it made me feel better uh, that I was not alone, that everybody's suffering like this. And, and by the way, Matt, when I hear sufferings like what your wife's going through, it encourages me because, because I go, she's staying with the faith and honoring God through her suffering. What an honorable thing. And that defeats Satan in the heavenly realms and, and is, is just, anyway, I, I'm, I thank God for it. I mean, I don't thank God for her sickness. Yeah, I know. What I'm not, I'm, but I, but that she's thanking God and honoring God through it. Right. I thank God for that. Yeah, I, I believe her reward in heaven is going to be great because she's not wavered in her faith. Amen. Her, she's prayed God. And so if I want to go see her in the afterlife, I'm going to have to make reservations to go up a few levels because uh, I think I'm going to be getting a corner with a mop, which is fine with me as long as I'm in heaven and be with my Lord. That's right. Uh, yeah, but we, yeah, we go through it. This is this is the reality of it. And, and you know, Brian, you're a pastor. I know that uh, you have to be counseling people who are suffering, and and uh, your heart must ache as you go to the hospital and see them, et cetera. We got a couple minutes before a break. Why don't you? Would you like to comment on on that? The reality of seeing this as a pastor. Yeah, um, you know. I- I very much do believe in physical healing. I, I believe God answers prayer. Um, and I think, and there are times when God is glorified by healing something and or delivering a person. But I think as we do, I think we need to not miss out on these many opportunities that God can be glorified through illness, through suffering, through loss through dealing with struggle right and you know so there's 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 opportunity here to take our current struggle and glorify god with it and become more like jesus through it and we have to embrace those things and we need to not think illness is like this you know this one area of life that somehow gets a free pass even though nothing else does, right? All of these other consequences of the fall, it's not just illness. Age itself is literally slow death. Mm -hmm. So if you live a day, then God doesn't, you know, everything Jesus accomplished on the cross that, you know, maybe we'll talk later. I do believe he purchased the ability to destroy all illness on the cross, but that doesn't mean we get it immediately. (laughs) Um, and we get it uh, fully in this life. And so every other consequence of sin, it's the, the struggle against demons. It's the struggle with the sinful flesh and the desires of the flesh. It's the natural disasters. It's the people who want to murder you. It's the persecution that the church around the world is facing, including a lot of our, a lot of our audience here. And it's, you know, so there's all of these consequences of sin that we go through. And this prosperity gospel this you know, it's the whole idea is that your best life now. And the truth is, you know, like um, Clay just said, it's it's not your best life now. It's your best life later. Somebody said that, I can't remember. (laughs) But we we all agree. So it's, you know, it's there are, you know, there's aspects of our best life that can be accomplished when we like internalize the truth of the gospel. Like we can start having spiritual benefits right away. You can have peace that surpasses all understanding in the midst of the struggle. Right. And those are things, you know, it's the, the fruit of the spirit. It's the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the goodness. There's, you know, perseverance, there's endurance, there's the sanctification that comes through when you go through struggle and you have to lean into God and trust him despite the stuff you're going through. And it builds mm-hmm. us and it makes us more like Jesus. It prepares us. It lets us confirm our faith through our witness it's part of our testimony. We need to embrace these things and not think that they're the enemy. Um, if God is allowing it to happen, and he clearly is, then there's a way to use it for his glory and for our good. And we need to embrace those things while praying for the healing, 
we need to embrace it if he doesn't, if he says no, or if he says not yet, or not in this way, right? We need to embrace it. Amen, Amen brother. Well, it's time for us to take a break, and uh, maybe we get back, we can talk about First Peter 2.24, by his stripes we are healed. It's an important verse, and uh, we can get back on that. So, folks, we'll be right back after these messages. Please stay tuned, and uh, just stay tuned. We'll be right back. We're watching Trinity Channel. Dear Trinity Channel and ABN viewers, we are excited to announce Trinity Channel's first marathon of 2022. The Prosperity Gospel Marathon will be premiering Monday, April 4th through Friday, April 8th, every day from 8 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We are looking forward to having you join us for the whole marathon Monday through Friday so that we can learn together the Word of God and be aware of false gospels thus sharing the true gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ around the globe. For more information, visit www.trinitychannel.com, www.abnsat.com, www.abnglobal.tv, www.1040discipleship.com, or you can call us at 1-248-416-1300. May God bless you richly. You are watching Trinity Channel. All right, everybody, welcome back to uh, ABN's uh, week on exposing the NAR, New Apostolic Reformation, as well as the Positive Confession Movement. I just want to let you know that we stay on the air by your support. Please consider supporting us financially, supporting ABN financially and uh, prayerfully. Both are very important. Please don't think we just do this for money. I know ABN does not. I've been out there to their studios. I've seen these guys. I've had dinner with these guys. They love the Lord Jesus. They want the gospel preached. And uh, they go through so much to do this. Please consider supporting them uh, financially. But also, uh, please, uh, prayerfully consider uh, lifting them up in your prayers on a regular basis. So <clears throat> I just want to let you know that uh, we're doing this the whole week. I'll be hosting tonight, as you can see, and tomorrow night and the next night. And uh, just praise God that ABN is working on discipling uh, in the project, uh, excuse me, has a discipleship project in eight Indian languages. That is awesome. That's awesome. And they are reaching out as the TV goes all over the world. We're praising God for that. Uh, ABN likes to preach the truth of the gospel and get hosts on and guests on. I've been in both places, guest and host, been out there, been here, and being able to preach the gospel. We are dedicated to the Word of God. We're dedicated to the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they are too. And so please uh, just consider supporting them and uh, praying for them. It's very, very important. And just one last thing. Uh, by God's grace, ABN was successfully able to cover uh, the 1040 window, including Africa, India, and China. And that's just awesome to hear. Uh, just praise God for that. You know, praise God. He does all kinds of things with all kinds of sinners, doesn't he? All right, let's get back on the air here with Don, Dr. Tony Costa, Dr. Clay Jones, and Pastor Brian Holmes. And I'm your host, Matt Slick, Reverend Slick. I need a doctorate degree so I can be called Dr. Reverend Slick. It just would sound so great, but I don't know if I have enough time to do that. Okay, so you guys are smiling. You like that idea too, don't you? I do. I think it's, it sounds good. I always tell my friends I'm far more slick than they are. And uh, what are they going to say? Yeah. So I learned to run as a kid because of that name. All right. Now, um, so this, this uh, it's an important verse. 
So uh, let's see who wants to tackle it first. By his stripes we are healed. First Peter 2.24 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that uh, we might be healed of righteousness uh, because by his stripes we are healed. And he's quoting the Old Testament. So who would like to talk about this issue of that verse, uh, by his stripes we're healed? Maybe Pastor Brian. Yeah, sure. Um, so the thing, the thing, and it's interesting that you started with this way of doing it. So you're already shortcutting what the prosperity gospel preachers would do um, because they would, this idea of living your best life now, getting your health and your wealth now, and you know your positive confession of faith to that effect, ultimately it's to serve you so you get what you want. That's the reason why you want that positive confession of faith. It's self-serving. Um, so, but the, they, would, they want that as their goal. And then they point to this, this quote of, from the Old Testament from Isaiah 53. And so as to mean that what Jesus paid for, what it's prophesying is that, that he is, um, that on the cross, he is paying for those sins so that he's purchasing our ability to be free of all illness. And so is there, and the problem with this is sometimes like they go so far off the deep end and say that yes, all illness is paid for and we're supposed to get it 100% of the time. You just need to have faith. But the problem is it actually, I've se I see it prominent teachers as well who go the other direction and say, uh, no, it's primarily or, or only spiritual healing that Jesus paid for and it has nothing to do with physical healing at all. And, and I kind of want to interject and be like, no, it's actually both. Um, and so if we look at the original, the original quote from Isaiah 53, and this is verses four and five, um, this is from the NIV translation. It says, surely he, meaning the Messiah, took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds. We are healed. And then as um, as you read earlier, Matt, um, you know, from first Peter two twenty four, this is, uh, you know, what Peter says, he goes, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we get perfectly healed of all illness. No, that's not what it says. It says so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness by his wounds. You have been healed. So the thing that Jesus is paying for primarily is our the spiritual consequences of sin. That's the, the primary thrust of the atonement is to purchase for us forgiveness of sin, eternal life, adoption, um, regeneration, eternal life with God. But the one thing that I feel sometimes gets neglected is that there's one other verse that's important in this conversation, and that's Matthew 8, uh, 16 and 17, where this is when the apostles, they're with Jesus, they're out there, they're healing people, and it says this. So this is also the word of God. So we can't just neglect this because it doesn't fit our theology. It says, um, many who were demon possessed were brought to him, Jesus, and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. So this same passage from Isaiah 53, while I affirm it is primarily spiritual in nature, there, what was also accomplished on the cross, and kind of to take us back before, it didn't happen three days later as Jesus was in hell fighting demons. It happened on the cross. Um, it is through his blood on the cross and he did purchase what was owed to satisfy the wrath of God for every sin, including the curses and the consequences of sin, which include death of which illness and disease and decay is a part of. So yes, th there is some truth to this idea that by his stripes were healed and that he took up our infirmities and took our diseases. So it's not unbiblical to 
pray that and to believe in that and and to to know that there's a biblical basis for that belief but i think it's we we can't we, that's a part of this larger conversation and all the other scriptures that show that god does allow illness it's not 100% in his will to always heal um and so i think i think that's just an important part of framing the conversation and we can't let our our biases and our predispositions go too far in either direction we need to understand that the the truth is somewhere in the middle amen brother all right um dr tony costa i want to ask you uh can i just add something uh sure about, please do i was just going to say about first peter 2 24 that it's interesting what peter does there and, and, I, and I think it's clear from 1 Peter 2, 24, he's talking about our sins. He took our sins upon his body and so forth. But what he does is Isaiah 53 says, by his stripes we are healed. Peter puts it in the, in the perfect tense. He says, by his stripes you have been healed. So he, he, he uses that perfect tense to show that this has been accomplished. And the perfect uh, always points out something that occurred in the past with ongoing results. Now, obviously, when we talk about salvation, if we trust Christ, confess that he is Lord, believe God, raise him from the dead, you'll be saved, Romans 10, 9. I believe that salvation, spiritual healing, is a guarantee to those who are saved. Physical healing is a benefit of the atonement. It's not a guarantee. It doesn't mean every Christian is going to be healed. It doesn't mean everyone who becomes a born-again believer will never be sick. And so I think that what Peter is driving at is that we have been healed, that is the perfect tense, from our spiritual disease, that is our sin that alienated us from God. And I, and I would agree, of course, um, with, with, with our brother, our, uh, the pastor, who, who points out that there's also this concept of Christ also taking our infirmities upon himself. But the healing of the body is something that scripture makes very clear is not always a guarantee a benefit. So Christ has conquered death, but we still die. And even though he has conquered death, you know, we have this tension in the new Testament called the now and the not yet so that we are risen with him spiritually. But one day uh, we will be raised physically as well in resurrection in bodily resurrection. And so there is this sense in which Christ has um, he has conquered death, but we still die. He has conquered our infirmities, but we still get sick. And so while we are in that interim between now and the, and the kingdom, um, we're going to continue to feel those after effects of the fall. But when it comes to salvation, I think salvation is a guarantee to all those who call on the name of the Lord. They shall be saved. It doesn't say they might be saved. They will be saved. But when it comes to physical healing, uh, which I, I believe in as well, I think it's fair to say that the scriptures are very clear that that Christians do not always get healed. Some of them have died, you know, great men and women of God throughout history. You know, we think of the Old Testament, the prophet Elisha died uh, of an illness as well. And, and Dr. Jones was talking about Trophimus and, and Timothy and even, even Paul's own thorn in the flesh. So that indicates to us that while healing is definitely a benefit of the atonement, it is not a guarantee that every single Christian is going to be healed in every single situation. Well, would you say that no guarantee we're going to be healed now, but it is a guarantee we'll be healed in the resurrection? Amen. Exactly. So it's that now, not yet. Yeah. The now, the not yet. I need to write an article on that for the website. People have been asking me about that more and more. Yeah. Uh, it's an important topic. And we've got about 15 minutes or about 12 minutes left in the show here. Uh, this issue of having enough faith, I know, Tony, uh, you, you can talk about that quite a bit um, because it's something that is important. I remember once when I was in college at a Lutheran college, I, I was reading the text of the Bible, you say this mountain be cast into the sea. Well, I lived close enough to the sea to give that a try. So I looked at a, a, a hill outside my dorm room. <sighs> And it didn't go anywhere. So I thought, well, I guess I don't have enough faith. So uh, what is this issue about faith then? Are we supposed to have it? It's supposed to happen because we have faith? Could you expand on that? Yeah. I mean, I've met so many people who some of them almost lost their faith because what these faith teachers do is they, they commit the fallacy of special pleading. And what they do is, well, the reason why you're not healed is not because of me. 
God forbid, it's not me. It's just that you don't have enough faith right. or, or you, had to, you have some hidden sin. And do you know what that does to someone who has the faith to move mountains and, and they're told, well, it's your fault that you're not healed. You just didn't have enough faith. And that is just so reprehensible. I mean, someone who's already suffering of cancer, they're probably stage four. They probably don't have much, much time to go. And, and their last thought from their pastor is, well, you just didn't have enough faith or you have some hidden sin. And, and that is just horrible. It's, it's so destructive. It is inhumane. And uh, it really kills the soul of a person. Um, and, and, and not only that, it's just not biblical at all. And, and so there's a lot of abuse that goes on in these circles. Absolutely. And, you know, it's like no heresy is ever by itself. And this kind of abuse, uh, you know, it often leads to other kind of things because you don't have enough faith. You have the spirit of, of doubt in you. Right. You have the spirit of whatever it is in you. Now you got to be delivered. And now you're under greater bondage. And you're right. It does do a lot of damage. I remember I did some volunteer work with uh, Christian Research Institute where Walter Martin was. We we're trying to do some fundraising. And I'll never forget this one phone call. I called up this this guy and and uh, he was just screaming, yelling because the, because his, he was not a Christian. His daughter was a Christian who went to a Christian church and they taught positive confession. She had gotten cancer and they said, don't go to the doctor claim your healing she did not get it checked and she ended up dying and he was livid yeah, and i spoke to him and i yeah and i said look we are here to stop that heresy there's nothing there's nothing wrong with going to doctors so let me ask you should we go to doctors is going to doctors okay or does that mean we don't have enough faith who wants to tackle that one well i will that's dumb <laughs> uh you know i mean it's like <laughs> Natural laws work in regular ways. We live in, this is a fallen world. Because it's a fallen world, it's disease ridden uh, that I think that when God cursed the ground, it enabled every cancer and COVID and everything enabled this. This is, I mean, anyway, I, I just think that's just a, a terribly dumb and destructive idea. And, uh, you know, I was, I typed this first in, but I'll, I'll mention it now. Uh, you know, Paul says, the, the, our outer nature, though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. Our outer nature is, wait wait a minute, I thought if I, my outer nature should be fine until just like God takes me home. He says, no, our outer nature, even though our outer nature wastes away, our inner nature, you know, is renewed day by day. He says, and the slight momentary affliction, slight momentary compared to heaven is doing what preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Uh, but but uh, and, you know, back to your specific question, Matt, Paul tells Timothy, drink a little wine for your frequent ailments and your stomach's sake that what not depend just to simply depend on the Lord that there might be some things that you can do health wise or maybe see a doctor or whatever. Yeah, I, I think that that's exactly what Paul was saying. I think that is exactly what Paul's saying there. There's things that you can do that aren't just simply have enough faith okay um so let's talk to the people out there who are listening so uh for example uh i had a gallbladder that was dying and uh if i didn't go in and get it taken care of it would have killed me i went to a doctor my wife had literally she's had open heart surgery and so if she hadn't had open heart surgery she'd be dead right now is it okay for us as christians to go to a doctor even though we know that god can heal us oh, don't or we say we don't have enough faith in God? Is that the case? Brian, what do you think of that? Uh, when you find out you're sick or you might be sick, first you pray and ask God to heal you on your way to the doctor. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then you believe that maybe God will even use the doctor to bring healing to you. Um, yeah, so it's it's not either or. It's both and. Um, you know, one other thing that... Uh, I, I could interject an interesting twist to this, and, I, and I'm likely the minority on this issue because I usually am. Um, but you, you said earlier about having faith to move this mountain. Um, and the two times that I'm familiar with where Jesus said that, um, I believe one time he's using mountain, actually both times he's using mountain as a metaphor, uh, not literally as an actual mountain. Um, and if we look at what the mountain represents, first it represents 
um, difficult struggles with demons. And then the other time it's religious leaders of the Pharisees at the temple. And so I think both times he's saying, if you have faith that we can remove this thing, either, you know, a demon in a person or um, the struggle with the temple, because he says, I tell you this, if you have faith and you, this will be done in three days. And then literally, you know, we find out later, the scripture tells us he was talking about the temple. I got to ask you though, if it's, if it's metaphorical, it's about the powers and stuff. Can we, you know, say to them, to, uh, you know, our government officials who are doing so many bad things, we can cast them into the, I I don't know. I'm just, I can't help. I think spiritual demons, not, not people that we want to call demons that are human. (laughs) So like, you you know, like there's, um, like the one time it's, I'm, I'm looking at the scripture here. This is, this is Matthew 17 for, for those who want to look it up later. Um, you know, the, the disciples come and they say, how come we couldn't get rid of this demon? And then Jesus literally goes into a teaching. Um, the reason you couldn't was because you didn't have enough faith. Um, but if you did have more faith, you could say to this mountain, like in the context of this story, he's talking about a demon harassing this boy um and it'll be and you can move it and so there is a bunch of scripture and include actually the vast majority of the times it says jesus healed or the apostles healed it says they were casting out demons and healing people of all illnesses and so there is a definite connection between demons that are causing illnesses and that's you know and that m- maybe puts me in the minority but I do believe that there are still demons in the world. I, sure. And I do believe well, of course that yeah. they are causing illness in people. Sure. And I believe that yeah. Christians who are born of the Holy Spirit have the authority and the ability to cast them out in Jesus' name. Amen. And a lot of times the illnesses that get healed, I, I believe the illnesses being caused by demons, they usually get healed when the demons leave. And so if it's a physical illness that God is allowing for whatever reason, that's a different thing than an illness connected to demonic oppression, which we have actual authority over. I don't think God ever wants to let people keep their demons, even though he might let people keep their illness. And so I think when we're praying for healing, if there's anything demonic connected to this, get out in Jesus name. And I I think we should embrace that. And at least um, it's a different part. It's a, it's a unique part of the conversation, but I think it's it's hey, an important part. I agree with you. I agree with you. I, I'm an experiential reform dude. I believe in all that stuff. It's still around. You got to be careful. It stuff happens. It does. If you look at TV a lot, you can see it. But uh, uh, could we add something very quickly? Sure. Yes, Luke was a doctor. He was a physician. He was Just one of the gospel writers. He was a traveling companion of Paul. No doubt, Paul would have had fevers and various ailments along the way. He was there to treat him. And again, medicine is a gift from God. It is it is God who's bestowed yeah, wisdom to is. men and women. And the various um, herbs and, and plants that God has created have been used to heal diseases and so forth. And, and even in Matthew 8, when Jesus healed the leper, even though the priest was not necessarily a doctor, he healed the leper and said, now go show yourself to the priest and to have yourself be cleared clean. And so there is this certification that if you're healed by God, the medical report will indicate that you've been healed. There's nothing to hide here. Uh, and so uh, it's and the, and the church created the hospitals. The hospitals were created by the church. Yes, right. And so we need to appreciate the fact that the compassion Jesus had on the sick and, and the marginalized was communicated throughout church history by the establishment of these institutions we call hospitals today. Amen, brother. Yeah. Christianity is a foundation of hospitals, medicine, science, and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff we could talk about in that respect. Okay, we've got a, uh, I think we've got like four minutes left. So how about if we do this? One minute each in closing. You guys can take a little bit longer. I don't need to, to say too much. So why don't we just start up with the uh, the infamous Dr. Uh, Dr. Clay uh, Jones here. Wait, one minute. How okay. can they get a hold of you? What do you want to say? And we'll, we'll rotate. Well, through. ClayJones.net. What could be simpler? But you know what? I really, I, I want to bring something forward from last, or the session yesterday we were talking about persecution in the prosperity gospel. The scripture does not promise that you won't be stripped naked, raped, and tortured to death. In fact, that's happening to Christians in Afghanistan and the Middle East right now. Nigeria. Uh, So I think that, I mean, right now, it has nothing to do with faith. The Lord does not promise it that you're going to have anything else. That's the history of the Christian church. Our answer to, in my one minute is, 
We need to look at heaven because we're going to live forever and ever and ever and ever where there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. And that's what the Christian needs to focus on. And I, I think it's important and helpful to, for the prosperity people to go, how do you reconcile that with the people in Afghanistan that are being raped and tortured to death right now? How do you reconcile prosperity with that? Anyway, uh, but heaven comes. You know, I, we uh, have a missionary in Nigeria, and he tells us regularly how the Muslims are coming in and killing people, uh, AK-47s. I could give you the details, but it's happening, and they're having to hide. And what do That's they right. do? This is the persecution right. that comes to us. Name it and claim it. Right. Your best life now, idiocy, just does not work there. All right, uh, Tony, close yeah. up. I mean, yeah, I, about, a, about a minute. Yeah, I would say pe people be, be beware of the work faith movement. It is not Christianity. Uh, it, it, it is selling you a, 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 a bad, uh, a bad uh, bill of goods, uh, corrupt fruit. Um, Jesus promised us that we would um, enjoy eternal life, that it is to come. In the meantime, he says, if you want to follow me, you deny yourself, you take up your cross daily, which means that you're going to suffer. And those who carry the cross are carrying the cross to their deaths. And so what that means is this. He didn't promise you a rose garden, at least here. But it is worth the cost to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, take up that cross. So please beware of the, the word faith movement. If you're more interested in, in any of my ministry, just check out my YouTube channel, Toronto Apologetics. Amen, brother. Amen to that. That is so true. All right, Pastor Brian. Pastor Brian. Uh, yeah, um, you can check out my ministry. It's uh, mpoweredchristian.org, just the letter M, poweredchristian.org. I, I think the to just kind of piggyback on everything that was said, the prosperity gospel movement is a false gospel and it is a deception. It's a deception. And in order to get what you're supposed to get out of your Christian uh, journey, you have to reject it because it's not about this life. It's a complete That's focus right. on yourself. It's selfish. And it's not, you don't exist for your own glory. You exist for God's glory. He created the universe and everything in it for his glory. He made us with free will. And this whole, this whole short lifespan of a hundred years or less is designed to help us come to faith, to trust him, to love him, to show him that through our walk, through our decisions to trust in Jesus and our, and, and living out that faith, um, practically and, and obediently and faithfully, we're showing him that we love him and that we want to spend eternal life with him. And so all everything that's happening right now is designed to help you firm that decision. So right now, as you're going through your struggles or the stuff that will come tomorrow, remember that two things are happening. One, you can glorify God through your struggle and you do. When you love him and trust him and lean on him for strength and faith and comfort in the midst of that struggle, you are glorifying him. And you're also doing a second thing. You're becoming transformed into the image of Christ. He is using your struggle and your trust of him through that. And you can actually become more holy, become more sanctified, become more righteous, become more like Jesus. And he he, the epitome was what he did for us on the cross. And so we're taking up our cross. We're following him. And there's a reason the scripture says he gives us the peace that surpasses all understanding because in the world, it looks like you shouldn't have peace. It looks like you're going through stuff and you don't want to have peace, but because the Holy spirit is empowering you from the inside, he will give you the peace that you need. And it, even if your life is being threatened and you're about to have your head chopped off or you're going through illness and you're about to die or you just lost your family or whatever else is coming, know that you can lean into God and trust him and he will get you through it and you will have treasure in heaven Amen. one day for it. Amen. And uh, just to end with that, uh, next week, ABN will be having a week-long uh, marathon on suffering for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It would be very appropriate uh, for people to listen to that 
and for the guests there because it's a real issue. It's a real problem. Gentlemen, I want to thank you uh, so much. Uh, Clay, Brian, uh, Tony, you guys are awesome. Really enjoyed it. And uh, may the Lord bless you greatly. And for all the, of those who are listening, I hope and I pray by God's grace that this has been a blessing to you. Please pray for ABN. Please support them. It's a great ministry. They're reaching out with the gospel and uh, they, they uh, really do need that support. So please uh, pray for them and pray for us as well as we continue to work for the glory of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless, Amen. brothers. Thank you, brother. We'll see you another time. All right. God bless. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Clay. Thank you. You are watching Trinity Channel. Dear Trinity Channel and ABN viewers, We are excited to announce Trinity Channel's first marathon of 2022. The Prosperity Gospel Marathon will be premiering Monday, April 4th through Friday, April 8th, every day from 8 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We are looking forward to having you join us for the whole marathon Monday through Friday so that we can learn together the Word of God and be aware of false gospels, thus sharing the true gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ around the globe. For more information, visit www.trinitychannel.com, www.abnsat.com, www.abnglobal.tv, www.1040discipleship.com, or you can call us at 1-248-416-1300. May God bless you richly.